we wanted to sneak in uh, again sort of more of an open conversation on some of the geospatial things that we've been tackling and working with here just to sort of provide an opportunity to raise awareness of some of these issues and to sort of open up a conversation on uh, a little bit of brainstorming or maybe advice or thought on what we can do about geos our geospatial future in the broad sense. Um, so again, for this session until the top of the hour, feel free to interrupt at any time. And I'm just going to go through three different topics that we've sort of been challenged with and thought a lot about and point you at a couple of resources that might help, you know, further this conversation in the future. Um, so in Taxon Works, we have the ability to assign geopolitical units or areas to basically the idea was down to second level subdivisions so counties or parishes if you're from the US um, to your collecting event you can also create geo references for that collecting event you can stack as many of those geo references as you want onto that collecting event and those collecting events can be Oh, sorry, those georeferences can be point-based or polygon-based or line-based. Um, so one of the things that we needed to do or we did very early on is we created a combined gazetteer or this global gazetteer that existed and we call that geographic areas. And this gazetteer is not editable by users of Taxon Works, um, and there's various reasons for that but it is fairly large in scope and one of the major challenges um, is is that it aggregated a couple of existing gazetteers so if those of you are familiar with gadm the the global administrative um what is it just something units um, it's a global ga shape gazetteer uh, it added the tadwig gazetteer it added the natural earth gazetteer um, and it also added some isospatial data as well. So yeah, thanks Debbie, GADM. And so when I search for something like Illinois in the system, an example of what that looks like is, is that there's not just one hierarchy. There's a, an integrated set of four different gazetteers uh, in, in the system. So what that comes up with when I type Illinois is that I have d entities from different sources. Here's some Illinois as represented in the Tadwig, and here's Illinois as represented in this the uh, the uh, natural earth data here. And this Illinois is as it's represented as a uh, a string in GADM. And so this gave us the flexibility we needed to be able to migrate data losslessly forward. We have migrated some existing species files that reference Tadwig forward. However, it also introduced a level of um, sort of ambiguity. Which one of these should I pick? And if you watched how TaxonWorks evolved, you can see that we started providing more and more metadata. Like how often have you used one of these in this project right here? So we started to try to bring people together by um, indicating how these are getting used. One of our main themes was that we want to move people away from typing in strings into your country, state, and county fields. We want to operate spatially. So you see here that these entities have spatial um, representations, and we want to get people to think about um, using the spatial representation as the canonical way to, to sort of georeference or uh, spatially locate your specimen. Uh, and, and being able to select Illinois, for example, when I select this, I also get the fact that it's part of the country and I get part of the fact that it's part of the, the earth. So I get all of that um, three fields, country, state, county, by selecting one thing. However, this created a bunch of uh, issues, right? There's a lot of maintenance then, like what happens when the big you know, 50,000 record geographic areas gets out of date? And this is not a problem that's specific to Taxon Works. Um, if you go and look at any of the providers of this, this is GeoBoundaries, it's very similar to GeoDM. You'll see 
that they have 982 issues that are closed and 161 that are open. So shapes and spatial units, et cetera, are, are very rapidly changing all of the time. Um, you can see the kind of different classes of problems that are existing here. Um, and they're constantly being updated. So one of the big ideas is that we would love to be able to outsource this, right? In TaxonWorks now, if we go look at those issues, we've started up an, a separate um, issue tracker and you can see exactly, and you might understand why these things are not having the same label, given the geopolitical situation or the labels are out of date or the shapes are out of date. Um, but we've got a, now a significant number. There's actually, I think, double this number, but we've started to aggregate those issues here. And all of these issues are completely pertinent to trackers that, you know, we got that, that are the source trackers for that kind of thing. And would they be better off served from there? Um, so one of the things I really didn't want to do is that nomenclature itself is tricky enough, right? You heard us mention that we have nomen and the rules of nomenclature in an ontology and that we spend a lot of time building in soft validations and other cool validation features for nomenclature. Geospatial names are even worse. There is no global way about how we should name areas and they constantly evolve. Um, there's multiple hierarchies throughout them and I didn't want to be in the business of asking our, our taxonomists and our, our collection managers to also be having to curate their own, another whole set of names, right? Because I knew these conflicts were gonna happen. I knew there was gonna be a constant set of issues that were just gonna add curatorial overload. Um, so this is all well and good, but things start changing. And I think one of our major challenges is where do we go next in Taxon Works? Do we try to adopt something like Overture Maps? This is a massive effort um, supported by Amazon, Meta, Microsoft. This effort recognized, and Esri right down here, this, recognize, this effort recognized that OpenStreetMap is the best mapping framework for collaboratively building maps in the world. And so it takes the open source, open data that everybody is providing and it merges it together into the kinds of APIs and services that we would want to use. Because it's the big guns, so to speak, there's a lot of overhead in understanding the OP APIs, but there's a lot of potential here. So do we create a meta service or does GBIF provide a meta service that would essentially let us replace our geographic uh, area found, um, framework with a framework that we could draw from that people would go and add issues and fix things in that framework instead of in TaxonWorks. This is one of our major questions and major challenges for us is where to go next after 10 years of, you know, a very successful um, set of tools. In the past week or two, we've found problems with indexing of these things. Like once you select one of these names, you want to have the the GADM or the geopolitical units um, um, appear in your data going out to Darwin Core. And that turns out to be tricky to get that all standardized when you're integrating across multiple different things. But we think we've improved that quite a bit in the just in the past couple of weeks. So any questions or comments on the use of um, global gazetteers or um, ideas about um, how your or, or challenges your communities have faced in trying to provide a spatial reference at the global scale. One of the other main questions I should point out is that we've explicitly tried to support down to second level subdivisions in the earth, but this fails in a lot of different ways because subdivisions aren't all equal. The division types are not all equal. Your country might be somebody else's territory or a different region. So there's no similarity just because you're level zero or level one or level two subdivisions doesn't mean that you're all equal. Just like we know is the case in taxonomy where families are not biologically comparable at, you know, across family levels. There's no real thing called family. It's just a classification system. Um, so how deep do we go? Tommy just added issues like I don't see St. Louis City, which is technically a second level subdivision in some, but it's not a county, right? How do we maintain all of that? And what have you found useful in sort of adopting that 
gazetteer challenge. So D Dima adds, would it make sense for people to start geopolitically and then clean up results to H3 or similar system to store data in geopolitically agnostic way? So Dima, in fact, what you point out is the challenge of aggregating results and mapping that I'm going to get to in, in a second here. Um, that actually inter introduces another major challenge. My main mantra with TaxonWorks was you shouldn't worry about anything except for the point, the point plus error on your specimen because we can always calculate back up to take that point into the aggregating map framework that we have. So I see Davide's hand came up. Davide. Yeah, since you, you were asking what we face as a community uh, or people working, um, I see that having multiple, despite that I understand the options, um, I found that people, they, we don't have consistency in what we choose as a boundaries, right? This is it's not per se a problem if at some point we can merge it pretty easily. Uh, but uh, that could be also something to take into consideration that if you have one unit that we can also discuss it's possibly sometimes easier for for people right mm -hmm. that's that's my two cents yeah absolutely as taxonomists we are trying to constantly classify things into one system so it feels very unnatural for us to to be presented with multiple classifications um, one of the beautiful things about representing your data spatially again, this gets back to data quality versus fidelity, is that if you make a true statement like this specimen is in this space, right, then that holds true much better than saying this specimen is in Canada, the word. What does that mean? Right? I don't know. But if you, so big part of TaxonWorks is knowing that part of the conventions and the ideas and the themes is for you to make true statements and just be happy, you know, content with making those true statements, but it doesn't have to be perfect, right? How it gets represented, the presentation, the, the persistence of the data versus the presentation of the data is a very challenging thing. Erica points out that the scope of the conversation, vision, political geography at this time, Erica, it is in the sense of geographic areas. However, if you stick around for next session, we're going to introduce um, a user gazetteer and that's another challenge or question for us and that user gazetteer could be whatever shapes you find useful like as you very well know it could be your experimental area right that you want to make queries on so that is essentially going to be a simplified gazetteer that the user can add their world wildlife shapes or their um, areas however how should we build that model to make it flexible but not crazy is one of the big questions uh, Samuel says, another aspect is the existence of locally defined areas that are used by a particular community. Exactly. There is literally infinite numbers of spatial sets of data. If you look at any of these aggregators, they are all aggregating at least 100, 200, 300 data sources. And in that aggregation, every data aggregation and is, is lossy, right? So you lose something and then they add something to it. And so balancing that, um, you know, we know that, for example, islands in marine areas are extremely hard to work with in the system. How do we get islands with names on them into uh, our data? And we know it's important because we have crab researchers and we have people collecting specimens and their favorite thing to do is to go on a collecting trip to an island in the middle of nowhere. So where is my political unit for my island in the middle of nowhere? That's not uncommon in our world. It happens a lot. Yeah, Fritz points out that there's no consensus in communities, exactly. Um, and, and exactly, there's a distribution. So one of my goals is getting back to this, this that challenge is perhaps maybe we'll jump to this is that, and Dima alluded to this, is that maybe we need to get away from thinking about our, our maps as, um, um, as, as geopolitically unit-based, right? But, you know, the other thing is, that, you know, so here's here's our existing aggregation and you can see geopolitical units. Right. But life doesn't follow those units. So can we get to something that's better and more accurate? Um, we certainly need to be able to classify specimens into geopolitical units because 
they're the ones that make the laws, right? And they're the ones that write the policies and they're the ones that do the permitting. So we have to know that level um, of data for specific tasks, but for biology, they don't make a lot of sense. And yet we're very hung up on getting checklists of the things in Uruguay. Why not have a checklist of the things in the box that I drove around, right? Or that I'm near to. Tommy, you had your hand up. Uh, I was actually just going to jump. I was going to say something before you kind of hit what I was going to say anyway is, yeah, we're, we're trying to use the boundaries we currently have for things that don't respect boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to go back to that data um, question that we talked about yesterday, which is how is the data useful? Um, so if you're creating, if you're focusing on where things occur in New Zealand, tax on works boundaries are completely useless to you because the boundaries that people usually talk about in New Zealand are not represented in tax and works. They have, I think we have North Island, South Island. I think that is about it. Um, and there might be some other ones, but there's actual biogeographic areas that people in New Zealand use and uh, those are not represented. So how do we hit the balance there? Because you're right, people still do want to know like what is in Australia, what is in New Zealand, you know? Um, and yeah, we can draw shapes right now. Um, yeah, anyway, there, there's also, I just wanna point out too, there are a lot of problems. I, I really like the idea of outsourcing this because I think if we try to manage it in tax on works, it's going to get insane um, already. Uh, it's already bad enough with things like edge cases where, you know, the specimen you are geo-referencing, of course, uh, is collected at the port city that just happens to not be in the boundary of the shape that you want to assign. Mm -hmm. um, like I've done a ton of specimens from Panama that were almost all collected by U.S. Army officers in the Panama Canal, and almost all of them are from port cities. And the boundaries for Panama just barely don't actually go over those port cities for whatever reason. Someone just was quickly writing a shape, and I want to update that. So that's yeah. a bit of a ramble but yeah so what tommy's what i what i think what we're pointing out is that as digitizers as curators we can represent truth right like i can still get all of those specimens that because i have those geo references because i've put them in a space but as soon as i need to aggregate those under a label new zealand or under a shape then i'm only as good as that label or that shape which to me is a lesser problem it's sort of like this it's a challenge, but it's a challenge we can address when we're answering very specific questions. However, it scales, that challenge scales across all of our specimens. Um, um, if I could really quickly just jump off of something else too. Yeah. Um, we can draw shapes in taxon works, which I've used a lot in the past, but our current systems don't necessarily interpret those shapes properly. So if someone, if the lowest level of administration on a label says something like Dixon Springs State Park, um, I can draw a shape around Dixon Springs State Park or import that from some other thing. I can put that on the specimen, but then when it exports, it gets exported as WKT. That does not actually come across as a set of coordinates. And so a whole bunch of people will ignore it because it's not the current, well, the main way that a lot of people are uh, yeah, thanks, Tommy. You, thinking you about things. So, so yeah, when I'm, when I'm exporting stuff for my research, I basically want a set of two points and a maybe uncertainty, and that's it. I don't want the big shape. I actually want a point and uncertainty. Yeah. So, so that's clearly that's definitely calculable and doable in in taxon works. In fact, we do that with the. Um, if you look at the geopolitical summary that that we have now, Tommy, and it's all points. That's actually taking those shapes that you've assigned, if that's the only thing, and putting it on the map. So that's completely co computably possible. Um, I think one of the other things you're pointing out is that after I draw this shape uh, and uh, Erica asked, you know, about the custom shapes, we want it so that once I do this search, there'll be another little button that says add to my gazetteer and you'll pop it up. You'll put a name in it. Then you'll have that and you'll, you'll there'll be a third link here in a geographic area that says gazetteer and you'll be able to pick up your your shapes as well. Right. Every search that you do when the system fails you for whatever limitations of the controlled vocabulary you'll be able to adopt to with a workaround. Debbie. So Matt, does that mean 
depending on how we build it, that if we can share those shapes across projects the way we've made it so you can share vocabularies and the way that it's a great question is currently I, shared. I, yeah. I think we can make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly we're going to want to be able to to br bring in controlled vocabularies like that and, and make it happen. So this is, a, but you know, the sharing part is also going to be tricky, right? Because we're already saying that the geographic areas um, are extremely hard to manage collectively. And we don't, you know, do we really want to get into that business of um, being able to, to edit things in different contexts, et cetera. So, hmm. Um, it's, it's, I think, I think it's, I think there's just like Debbie, just like we built the import your controlled vocabulary from another project functionality. Right. I see that completely. Right. Like, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, and that's yeah. what I was talking about. Yeah. Okay. I, I was thinking of a specific use case and again, I'm, others will have, uh, come up with here. So, um, this botanist that works in Papua New Guinea, and it, this is a very particular use case. The, the people in the village call their village by a name and you could some circumscribe it and then they move and their village ends up somewhere else it's a difficult use case right because then they call the village by the same name and so if somebody else is working in papua new guinea and they have that they're tracking that data you could see that by able to share those shapes people wouldn't have to do the same work over again to exactly describe that's why it has to be spatially based right mm -hmm. we cannot yeah, be label exactly. based yeah exactly yeah so two I wanna, minutes Thanks, Jeff. I want to point out one other challenge if there's people from the standards bodies here. Um, one of the things that we do when we create a, a, a species revision or we revise a taxon or we create a taxon page or we describe species is we aggregate historical data and new data. That means in Darwin core parlance, we, we, we aggregate checklist data and we aggregate occurrence data. Right. In taxon works, that means aggregating asserted distribution data. You see here these orange things. These are assertions that this taxon was found in this area according to this source. So it's a little three level data object with collection object data, which is geo references and type materials, another kind of collection object data here, too. So one of the fundamental products that we produce requires the merging of historical data and point data. Yet the Darwin core doesn't let us merge those nicely. Like the occurrence type, the, the kind of occurrences that we have, don't let us merge that literature-based data and specimen data in that context. So to me, there was, when we built this out, we forced the asserted distribution data into the Darwin core. For any of these pages, you can get your Darwin core of the data behind the scenes. And you can see, um, that that data that that led to this thing let me show you an example here if i step up to a higher level um, there's a lot of challenges that also get into computing these aggregated maps right so for this map here there's there's fifty thousand data points and to do that on demand over time and keep that updated is another major challenge for us people like holgers here and and maria marta have been waiting for um, better synchronization. You see, this is not synchronization of the raw data with the map to produce. And so if you know how GBIF produces maps, they're constantly always calculating new maps, always in the background with a huge number of resources. So it's a major challenge. Um, but what I want to say is here, I, we have to aggregate um, asserted distribution data, 17,000 taxon by place by citation pieces of data with 37,000 specimen records. And there's no fundamental format for doing that. So we put both the sort of distribution data and collection data into the occurrence file, but it's kind of like forcing square peg into round hole there. So that's another major challenge. I think that really reflects the fact that some of the work that we've been doing at the standards level wasn't as grounded as it needed to be um, in the day-to-day -day processes of what taxonomists were doing, right? They were very collection-oriented, occurrence-oriented. So I think there's opportunities there. Um, we are up for time here. We did actually cover a lot of those topics. Yep. Um, Briefly, there is a question from Monique about does the tool yeah. have the ability to suggest points with a shape based on a given location, like geolocate? 
Um, so Monique, the, we can actually cut and paste geolocate georeferences directly into the georeferencer. Um, so that may answer your question. Um, let's see here if I go, yeah. So I think, and, and it already, we already do some lat long extraction in, in the processing of labels as well. But you can add a georeference by, by pasting a geolocate response. So you can do your georeferencing and geolocate, copy paste into there and you've got it. You can paste WKT format shape to georeference. So you can shape, you know, take your polygons or your points. Um, you can basically one click to add your georeference based on the text that's coming out there too. So. I, I think there's a lot of different possibilities there that are nicely already integrated into the system. All right. I think in the interest of time, we'll push forward to more talks by me.